Sorry, guys. I didn't put the volume down. I need to shave and I need to trim, man, because I look older now. How you guys doing? Pray that the internet connection stays strong. Everybody here? Yes, he did, Michael Pabst. He became a Muslim again. Nothing but feelings. Does it sound good? Does it sound good? Wait a few minutes, begin in prayer, and begin the session. Feeling Nina J. I keep forgetting. Are you a Syrian? What's up? Are you sure, Magdalene? The only problem, Magdalene, my Nubian princess, is I don't have a barber to then not trim it, but, you know, to keep it smooth. Smooth operator. Smooth operator. Coast to coast, the lake to Chicago. Smooth operator. Thank you, DJ Next. You know, no, really. Let me let me let you in on a little secret. Being the youngest of six, being the youngest of six, there are four boys, two girls. <clears throat> I was never allowed to pick up after myself or clean because I had two older sisters. And every time I would try to clean, they'd come and clean over me. So what that taught me was to be incompetent. I'm very incompetent when it comes to cleaning, ironing, knowing how to match clothes. Those are serious defects. I'm not, you know, I'm, when it comes to that, forget about it. And so my, my older brother's living with me, and he's a clean freak. So I get on his nerves. So that means I'm a handful. I'm a handful, folks. Being the youngest of six, two older sisters, Middle Eastern family, they didn't let you do anything. They did everything for you. But then later on in life, look, 48 years old, and I, I live like I'm a bachelor. So I even scared uh, Magdalene away. I scared her, see? She's like, oh, my goodness. Yes. So that's how it is, man. What are you going to do? Exactly, Zarina. That's right, sister. I'm now suffering. Oh, so what are you trying to say, Magdalene? That other days I wasn't looking nice? Is that what it is? Oh, yeah. No, yeah, but those are my defects, honestly. I don't know how to match clothes. I'm not that coordinated, you know. And because I'm the youngest of six, I'll pick up... <clears throat> and do stuff when I feel like doing it. Whereas the problem is some people want it to be done right away. So that creates problems and chaos. So Orthodox defense, you're 20. So you have an excuse. I'm 48, bro. I'm old enough to be your, I'm old enough to be your daddy, sucker. You sure about that? See now Magdalene, I need someone who can help me coordinate, you know, like know how to match the clothes, what to dress, what not to dress, help me trim. I'm think of that one gorgeous beat. Arr! Well, I am Orthodox defense. Technically, I'm old enough to be your dad. Why, Snow? Uh, do you look like me? But thank you, Mohammed bin Jars. I'm not 44. I'm 48. Yeah, I'm old enough to be your brother. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm old enough to be my brother. <laughs> you little sinner, bro. Yeah, in a mu Muslim country, um, I'd be old enough to be... If I was in a Muslim country, I'd be an old, old enough to be uh, Orthodox defense uh, grandfather. You're right. Okay. Hopefully, everyone will show up. Are the mods here? Yes, they are. Uh, and I don't mean mods. I mean, are the mods that post verses for me here? Muhammad Maya, I may do that. I may discuss it. And you don't look a day over 135, General. Sanguine spark. Razzle dazzle. Okay, Razzle, if I tell you, I'm just that because it's COVID-19 and we're all stuck inside. I got my jacket on, the shirt on, but not my dress pants on. So you can get away when all you have is the camera looking at the top, you know, the, uh, 
part, top part. You can put on a jacket and a nice dress shirt, not wear the dress pants, just put on shorts. <laughs> yeah, but if I was going outside, then I'd put on the uh, dress pants. I'll pray for you at the end of the day. Is Protestant here? He's always protesting, man. Newsroom, the anchor. Joe, oh, I don't speak that language. Is the Protestant heretic here? I guess not. Riaz here? Somebody here? Anybody here? I'm looking schwelt. Yeah, yeah. I'm Oli. I'm looking schwelt. Very schwelt. Mom in Virginia. Is he not here? Isn't it weird? You're 15 years old, at Nina J. Oh, there goes the heretic. I didn't see you. Yeah, yeah, you're here. Nina J, you're 15? Please, Sam, are you ever going to do that? I don't know, Pedro. I may do that. So, and you were looking into Islam? How you doing, Kentucky Fried Chicken? Okay, here. No, he's here. The Protestant's here. So, well, wait. So you're still 15 now, Nina? Just curious. I'm confused. Were you saying when you were 15, you were interested in Islam, or you are now 15? Let me understand what the sister is saying. Sharp-dressed man, blue shoes. Let me see. I want to see what the sister is saying. Shvel, yeah, yeah. I am Oli. Okay, you're 16. So now, by the grace of Jesus Christ, you're no longer interested in Islam, right? God bless you, Luis. I hope it's blessed you. I hope it challenged you, stretched you, and it's filling you with the peace and joy of the Lord Jesus Christ, Luisa. Thank you, Rochelle. God bless you. So no more Islam, right, Nina? You're in love with Jesus Christ? No more Islam? Just want to make sure because I got scared for you. Shlama. Shlama, Johannes, you Masadi brother. I just want to find out. Hold on. Nina, just I want to make sure. No more Islam, right? You're dead to Islam. You'll never consider Islam, right? I'm just concerned for our sister. Let's see. Before the rapture, Nina, I don't want to leave you behind. Oh, Nina. Hey, Nina. Why take you so long to answer? When you can answer very quickly, we can proceed. Why, you little, evil, wicked. I'll tell you why, Nina. You still look at this. Look how Satan's trying to ensnare her. She still has an interest in Islam. You know why? I'm going to tell you why, Nina. Tell me if I'm wrong. And don't lie to me. Because you're going to answer to God. You're interested in a Muslim man. There's a Muslim man that caught your attention. Don't lie to me now. Be honest with me. Okay. You're interested in a Muslim man. You sure you're not? Oh, okay. You know what's sad, folks? Here's what's sad. There are people who have to learn the hard way. What do I mean by that? God will tell them plainly, this is not the path to follow, and this path will lead to destruction and misery. And no matter what the Lord shows them and answers their objections and shows them how real he is, still they decide to go against God's command they end up doing what God tells them not to do. And you know what's sad? Nina's 16. Her path, if she doesn't repent, and, I, and that's her life. She's going to destroy her life. She's not going to destroy my life. She's going to end up becoming a Muslimah. She's going to find a Muslim man who's going to use her and abuse her, right? Get her pregnant with several kids and then dump her. And then she'll come to her senses and realize what a stupid fool she was for not trusting Jesus but following Muhammad, a pedophile pervert. And I'll be honest, you deserve what you're what you're about to get. You do. You have sisters here. 
that were married to Muslims. Light 68. She sometimes shows up at night. She follows me on Facebook. Light 68. She was married to a Muslim man. And for years she was a Muslim man. <clears throat> Divorced with kids. She's now in love with Jesus Christ. She worships the Trinity. Right? And she's been restored. But she wasted so many years of her life following a false prophet. Yeah. It has nothing to do with a Muslim man now. When you become a Muslim, what do you think you're going to do? Marry a Catholic? An Orthodox? Which Catholic or Orthodox Protestant is going to marry you? If they're true Christians, they'll never marry an unbeliever, especially an apostate that left the true God. It's disgusting what some people will go through to learn the hard way, right? It's sad, but there's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing you can do about it. See, Alan Ruhl just said, Alan Ruhl just said, I know a couple of women who were married to Muslims that all ended the same way. I know too. I'm going to share a tragic story. I'm going to share a tragic story. And I don't know what happened to that young lady. I'm going to share two tragic stories now. Okay. Two tragic stories. Okay. One of them I don't know. Well, I don't know what happened to either one of them. Okay. <clears throat> a young sister in the Lord Jesus Christ that used to do ministry with the center I was affiliated with in Chicago. Guys, I want you to listen to this, please. Okay. <clears throat> she had told me that when she was in New York studying to reach Muslims, that she had heard of a woman who was a Christian that became a Muslim. She's a Muslim. And she was making the circuit, going around, telling people her story. She went and heard the woman, and she was shocked at what she heard. Why? Because the woman was a graduate of Moody Bible Institute. Now, for those of you who don't know why that's important, Moody Bible Institute is one of the few evangelical Bible institutes that still teach the inerrancy, infallibility, inspiration of Scripture, and it's located in Chicago, and I was raised in Chicago. Okay. This woman graduated from Moody as a professing, Committed, born again Christian, evangelical. She went on a mission trip to China. She came back disheartened, <clears throat> discouraged, because according to her, she saw the disunity among the Christians. And that troubled her. So what happened? She found Islam, embraced Islam, gave up on Jesus Christ, became a Muslima, married a Muslim man, and they were propping her as some type of like, you know, Miracle story. So she'd go around and telling people, I was a graduate of Moody Bible Institute. Now, I don't know what happened to her because I'm talking about this was early 2000s, maybe 2002, 2003, maybe a little later, but it was over 10 years ago, if memory uh, doesn't fail me. So she left Jesus to become a Muslima, and it's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time that she ends up divorced and abused. If that's already, if that hasn't already happened, because I don't know what happened to her. I even forgot her name. And I actually saw her picture in the Moody Bible Institute graduation book. You know how every year they have a book with the pictures of their graduates? So the sister in Lord showed me her picture. She was a Moody Bible Institute graduate. Okay, so that's that's one testimony. Let me share another testimony with you. And I met the girl's father. As the Lord Jesus fills my lungs and chest and throat with the breath of life, give me the health I need to glorify him and anoint me to magnify the name of Jesus, to convict people by the power of the Holy Spirit, to be used of the Spirit to glorify Jesus Christ. Okay. Another story, another testimony. <clears throat> What's the name of that church in California? Rick Warren's church. Rick Warren's church. What's the name of that church? Yeah, it is exactly Ro 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 Alan Rohul. It's an apostasy. Saddleback, okay. True story, I met the father. A rich Christian, and if I say white Christian, you're going to think I'm being racist. I'm not being racist. He was this white suburbanite, upper class, very rich. I think he was even a millionaire. Member of Saddleback, Rick Warren's church. His daughter was part of the evangelical team, evangelizing people. She was engaged to a Christian man. Listen to this. She was engaged to a Christian man. 
her fiance and her met this Muslim and they try to witness to him and he would bring typical objections. He then started eyeing her. Now watch this, guys. Watch this. What a low life, scum, filth dog this guy is. Let me tell you what kind of low life scum. I mean, scum is even cleaner than him. He knew this young lady was engaged. He still swept her off her feet. She broke off the engagement with her Christian fiance, broke his heart, fell in love with the Muslim man, ended up abandoning Jesus and became a Muslim Muslima. And her father and mother were devastated. And I remember seeing the father and mother and the mother was in tears. Devastated. I remember seeing the mother and she was in tears. She was crying. He even had Nabil Qureshi speak to her on the phone and try to influence her and her then fiancé to come back. And everything he said went in one ear out the other. Do you know why, guys? Do you know why? Because once Satan snatches your heart, your mind takes a back seat, goes out the window. See, Satan is smart. Satan knows if he can manipulate you emotionally, he gets you intellectually because your mind takes a back seat to your heart, to your emotions. This is just a fact. Look at all the problems you create for yourself or problems created by others. It's all because of emotions, because people are emotionally unstable. People have no control over their emotions. They let their emotions dictate their actions and take over their better thinking. This is a fact. This is a fact. You know that? So I don't know if she's divorced now. Now let me tell you how bad it gets with this young lady. Not only did she become a Muslimah, she ended up marrying him. And guess what, folks? Guess what, folks? Guess what? She moved to Jordan to live with him and his family. And guess what her father did? Because he's a stupid imbecile. Yeah, you are a stupid imbecile. I hope you're listening to this. He decides to go buy a house in Jordan so he can live close to his daughter. See that? Do you know why? Do you know why? Because when your emotions take over, the mind takes a back seat. Now, Nina says she's confused because she said some Catholics say Catholics and Muslims worship the same God. Oh, boy. We were sailing along. Okay, Nina, let's say for argument's sake that's right. How does that make Muhammad a prophet? How does that make Muhammad a prophet, Nina? Boy, man, uh, guys, you got to really pray for me, honestly. Uh, when I say this, pray for me because I, I am drained emotionally. And let me say something. When you are drained emotionally, emotionally when you're under stress and you're drained, it makes you physically tired. Now, here's what's ironic. Let me tell you what's ironic. Though I'm drained emotionally and I get sad and lonely because I don't have my daughters, at the same time, and the Lord bears witness when I say this, at the same time, there's this peace and joy and love and calmness that fills me. You know that's the Holy Spirit, all glory to the Holy Spirit. But I get tired, man. I really get tired. I am. Like right now, I'm drained. I'm drained from all the emotional stress. And then when I hear someone like Nina tell me, She's confused because someone told her, a Catholic told her, that Muslims and Catholics worship the same God. Okay. I can't address that right now. I'll probably do a session on it. I'll do a session on it. Johannes, brother, can you come live with me and tell me how to live my life? Johannes, you know you're getting me angry, right? Can you tell me when to wake up in the morning, what to eat during the day, what to dress, when to wash my clothes, when to take a bath. Why don't you just control my life and tell me what to do, Johannes? You keep doing this, brother. Every time you come to my sessions, you keep telling me what to do. Brother, you know, I'm going to end up breaking my rule. I'm going to bounce you, right? I do not like people telling me what to do on my channel. Can you stop? Well, if this is love, keep it. Show this love to someone else, Johannes. Please don't love me, brother. 
Please don't love me. I don't want your love. Please, if this is love, oh the billah min Muhammad rajim. Keep this if this is love. Give it to someone else. I wonder what you do to me if you hated me. Please, man, if we have the same blood, I'm gonna I'm gonna get a blood transfusion. If we have the same blood, I'm gonna get a blood transfusion. Okay. Pro post -pro Proverbs 28 26. Proverbs 28 26. The guy kills me, man. He comes in here, tells me what to do and how to do it. Sam, did you eat Wheaties this morning? No, I ate cornflakes. No, Sam. Tomorrow I want you to eat Wheaties. Sam, did you brush your teeth after you ate? No, I brushed it before. No, after you eat. Sam, did you trim your beard? No, trim it, Khun, because we have the same blood and I'm a dictator and I can dictate your life. No, it's not advice. It's control, Johannes. Johannes, let me give you some advice. If you're this controlling, don't get married because you're going to get married. Try to control a woman and she'll beat you black and blue. Okay. All right. Now, Proverbs 28, 26. Please stay single, brother. Have mercy on these women. Stay single. Okay. Proverbs 28, 26. Nina, read this. Okay. Proverbs 28, 26. Nina, this is for you. Let's post it again so she can see it. Sorry, brother Protestant. You know, I don't pay you nothing for nothing. Okay. Read this, Nina. Proverbs 28, 26. Okay. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. He that trusteth, trusteth in his own heart is a fool. Nina. Proverbs 28, 26. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. But whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. Nina. God said, you are a fool, you're stupid if you trust in your emotions. Because your emotions will mislead you. Your emotions must be governed and controlled by the Holy Spirit and the word of the Holy Spirit, the Bible. He who trusts in his heart is a fool. You're stupid. Proverbs 28, verse 26. So now, okay, Georges, you need to get out of my channel. Don't come back, Georges. In fact, Georges, if you're going to run your mouth, I'm going to actually set up a debate with you on Sola Scriptura, and I'm going to embarrass you and humiliate you because you're, you're a dumbass. Okay. Right. Now, Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 6. Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 6. Okay. I don't mean to insult asses because, remember, Alex, God even used an ass to rebuke a false prophet. So I don't mean to insult asses. Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 6. Because you can see how stupid this guy is. Where did I get this from? I got it from Scripture. Oh, see? So much for Sola Scriptura. Moron. Idiot. The Bible told me this. If the Bible didn't tell me this, I wouldn't know this, would I? You braying ass. No insult to asses. Okay, Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 6. Okay. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall... Direct thy paths. One more time for Nina. One more time for Nina. Post it again for her, and then we begin. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. So notice what the Bible said. The passages that refute Scola Scriptura, according to this idiot, this moron. Where did I get... The idea that you should trust your emotions, the Bible. Where did I get the idea that you you should trust God and let Him guide you and not your emotions, the Bible? And see, so much for Sola Scriptura. <laughs> so much for Sola Scriptura. <laughs> Stupid man. I don't want to insult asses because an ass is smarter than you. I got it from the Bible. So much for Sola Scriptura. You dumb ass. What do you want me to tell you, man? Same thing, say I'm just referring to the girl. Okay. Okay, now. So coming back to you, Nina. Coming back to you, Nina. The Bible says you're stupid and foolish if you trust your emotions. Okay? What did the Bible say? Trust in the Lord God, trust in Jesus. Let him direct you and guide your path. Take him at his word. Obey his word. Trust his word. And he will protect you even from your own emotions. Okay? 
Now that said, let's begin. We praise you and we love you, Father. We praise you and we love you, Lord Jesus. We praise you and we love you, Holy Spirit. Bless this session. Anoint it with the power of the Holy Spirit. Anoint me with wisdom and knowledge from your spirit. Empower me to recall the passages perfectly. Interpret them correctly, Father, for the glory of the Lord Jesus. Save me from error and stammering. Save us from distractions of Satan and Satan's children who want to confuse and and create chaos. Rebuke that, Father. Lord Jesus, rebuke that. Holy Spirit, rebuke that. And fill everyone here, Holy Spirit, with wisdom and knowledge. And give us the power to not only know the word that you inspired, but to live it out by your power for the glory of Jesus. And please, Holy Spirit, help me not to be a crowd pleaser and tickle ears, but also not to be unnecessarily offensive. Please, Holy Spirit. We yield to you. I yield to you. And Holy Spirit, watch over Nina. Convict her. Be a fire in her heart to crucify her flesh and take her captive for the Lord Jesus Christ. Please, and I pray that for all of us. Bless our loved ones. Bless my daughters and preserve them. Use this session and bring them, Holy Spirit, and anoint me to glorify Jesus and bless your servants, Holy Spirit. The church of Jesus Christ, the household of the living God. We need you, Holy Spirit. We yield to you and we trust in you and we love you. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Increase in us. Cover us by your blood. Cover our loved ones, my daughters, by your blood, Lord Jesus, the blood of the Lamb that makes us more than overcomers. And again, thank you, Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Yehovah Father, Son of Spirit. Yehovah Father, Son of Spirit. Yahovah Father, Son of Spirit, in Jesus' Almighty name. Yahovah Rapha, Yahovah Rapha, Yahovah Rapha, Father, Son of Spirit, in Jesus' Almighty name. All right. To the dead. Alan, that was the last I heard, Alan. You guys, I know you want to know what happened to those two women. I don't know. But you know those marriages won't last, right, Alan? They're either already divorced and they destroyed their lives or they will end up getting divorced, right? They will end up getting divorced. It's not going to last. You know that. Especially when you know Jesus and have tasted Jesus and turn your back on Jesus and abandon Jesus, you know you're not going to be happy because your heart was created to be in love with Jesus. Jesus is the source of our love and peace and joy. And when you cut off yourself from the source of true love and peace and joy, what do you expect is going to happen? Uh -huh. Johannes, brother, Kuni, brother, can you leave my, my channel, brother? No hard feelings, brother, but I want you to leave. Aziza, can you make it easy for me and you just leave, Kuni, please? Alex Gonzalez, these are some of my Sahih narrations. And Shamuni pleaded, please leave my challenge. Johannes, go out, get out of here, brother. Get out of here now. I'm going to block you. You got to get out of here. Do not come back to my channel. If you love Christ, stay away from me. Get him out of here, guys, please. Get him out of here, please. Please, guys. I can't deal with this guy anymore. Thank you. Whew. And you're sorry about that. So hopefully by the grace of God, he won't come back. Okay, now with that said, Dylan. Why would Nina want to watch Apostate Prophet, Dylan? Can you help me understand your logic as we begin? Dylan, help me understand your logic in guiding Nina to a channel that's about not only refuting Islam, but it promotes atheism. Dylan, help me understand your logic right now. Let me understand your logic. I had made a promise I wasn't going to block people, but sometimes the stupidity and level of stupidity is too much. Why would you misguide this young lady who's 16, who's already confused, to a channel by an atheist who doesn't believe God exists? Help me understand. Dylan, please help me understand. Why don't, Dylan, why don't you have your daughter go listen to Apostate Prophet and Matt Dillahanti and other atheists? Why don't you encourage your daughter to do that? Let me guess, you have no children, right, Dylan? Let me, I want to know if my assessment is right. Do you have children? No, because he doesn't have children. I guarantee you he doesn't have children. See, didn't I say it? You know why? Because a parent of a child 
loves their children so much that they, they, they wouldn't encourage them, if they're believers who love Jesus, to go listen to atheists unless they want to destroy the faith of their children. You see, this is how I know you had no kids because you have no sense. You know, Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Just like you wouldn't want someone to tell your daughter to go listen to an atheist and lose faith in Jesus, why would you then do that to someone else's daughter? Why would you do that and encourage someone's daughter who's 16 and impressionable to go listen to an atheist and lose her faith? So you mean David Wood is not good enough for her? Forget David Wood. He sucks, right? Osama Dakdok is not good enough for her. So Christian men who destroy Islam while glorifying Jesus Christ, you don't encourage you to go listen to them, but to an atheist. And I help, pray I'm not too loud and I don't distract my neighbors. Daniel, brother, go get out of here now, brother. Daniel Roach, you are a roach. You need to go. Did I want to break my policy? Daniel Roach, leave the stream. Do not unblock Daniel Roach ever again. Leave the stream, Daniel Roach. Get out of here. I'm going to be breaking my policy today. Why are you unhiding him? Okay. Sorry, I'm not going to tolerate it today. I'll go back, try and live up to my policy tomorrow. Okay. Anyone else want to tell me how to run my, my, my channel? Come on. Johannes did it. I send him back to Nineveh. Daniel Roach did it. I send him back to Roachville. To his fellow roaches. Anyone else, please, before I begin, anyone else tell me how to run my channel, please? Because today I'm going to break my, my rule. I'm going to start blocking people. Please, someone tell me how to run my life. Tell me what to wear, what to dress, what toothpaste to use, what to eat, when to sleep, when to wake up. Please, please, guys. I'm in that kind of mood today. I'm in a very good mood today. Okay. Are we ready now? All right. Ready now? May the Lord Jesus be glorified. May he crucify our flesh and may he fill us with the spirit. Okay. I'm going to answer the questions that was asked of me in the previous open Skype Q&A session that I didn't get around to answering. I was asked about Mark 13.32. Now, the brother that asked me about Mark 13.32 told me that he went and found my sessions on Mark 13.32 and that he listened and that satisfied his curiosity. Glory to Jesus Christ. Everything perfect and good we do is from the Holy Spirit. Everything imperfect, everything fallen, everything sinful comes from Protestant believers. So he gets the blame. Okay, so we blame him for our imperfections. So now with that said, let's focus. Help me to help you. Here's my policy. I'm trying to be as gracious and by the power of the Holy Spirit, yield to the Spirit to help me control myself. I don't want to block anyone except for two reasons. Here are the two reasons that's going to get you a block. Today was an exception. Okay, number one, if you blaspheme the triune God, insult the Lord Jesus and his word, you're gone. Number two, if you dare justify abortion and you try to explain it away, that it's not murder, it is murder, murder of unborn innocent children, an abomination aside of God, you're going to go away. Now, the mods have freedom and my permission to block anyone they deem fit per their discretion. But if you attack me, mock me, I don't care about that. You can attack me, mock me. But just, again, I'm going to go back because I want to unblock people who, are, who will come and maybe hopefully by the grace of God's spirit will listen and learn, right? But one thing, don't do, please, don't tell me how to run my show and what to say and how to answer. Start your own YouTube channel. Start your own YouTube channel and teach, okay? It's easy to sit behind your screen and tell someone who's doing it how to do it. Really, it is. It's easy for you to tell David Wood how to do it or... Or James White, you know what? But ZipTheLip.com, ZipTheLip.com until you start doing it. Shh, zip, shh. Now let me let you in in a little secret, biblical secret as we begin. Are you ready? 
I have strong biblical principles, Alistair Johnson. So if those biblical pr principles sound Catholic, that tells you that in those areas, the Catholic principles are thoroughly biblical. So let me correct you. I have thorough, thorough biblical principles. So if there are things in Catholicism, right, <clears throat> principles in Catholicism that you hear me espousing is because those principles are biblical. They're anchored in Scripture. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now, with that said, let me let you in a little secret in the beauty of the Hebrew Bible. And this is for the sisters here. This is for the sisters here. Sisters, are you ready? Hello, Amanda. I don't know how to pronounce your last name. Zori? All right, Zori. You know, if you take the Z out of your name, Zori, and, and you put G, Godi, that means Amanda Godi, my husband. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. Genesis 2.23. Let's begin, guys. Genesis 2.23. Genesis 2.23. Let me, sisters, I want you to listen to this. There's a secret message there. Secret message. Genesis 2.23. It's a sacred message for women. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, guys, here's the beauty of the Hebrew. And if Abdul Hadij, my Masadi brother is here, he'll confirm. In Hebrew... Adam said she'll be called Isha, Isha, because she came from Ish. Let me transliterate for you. The word for woman is Isha in Hebrew, because she came out of Ish, man. So this is what Adam said. You are Isha because you came from Ish. In fact, how many of you are aware that the English word woman means womb of man? Woman means womb of man. So you're called woman because you came from the womb of man. In Hebrew, she's called Isha because she came out of Ish. The Hebrew word Ish can mean male or husband. Isha can mean female or wife. Okay? Now you guys know that? You know that? But let me tell you the wisdom in that statement. See, you guys don't know the wisdom. What hidden wisdom lay in those words? Isha and Ish. Are you ready now? You know what the wisdom is? Now, Gilgamesh, watch this. Isha from Ish. The wisdom is that because you are from Ish, a man has the right to say to you, Ish. Ish. That's the wisdom. Did you catch it? Even in the naming... Women, know your role. Women, know your role. You came from Isha. I'm mean, saying so you, you are Isha, came from Ish. So, hey, Ish. And if you want to do it in Jinu, it's even better. Ish Kalach. Kora. Ish. Daddach. See? Now, what I just say, Ish, your voice. Silence your voice, you blind woman. Your mother's mother. That's just what I said in the Syrian. Okay, let's start with Hebrews 1.5 today. Exactly, Hebrews 1.5. You wish. Ah, I like that, Anna. You wish. All right. Let's go to Hebrews 1.5. Let me unpack this. Sorry about that. I'm losing so much weight, you can see my chest hairs. I don't want to be a stumbling about to my sisters. I'll shave my chest hairs. I don't want to stumble, cause you to stumble. Hebrews 1 verse 5. Unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Let's look at that verse again. I'll pray. The Spirit fills us so we can focus, so I can be a blessing to you. Pray for me that the Lord will increase my wisdom and knowledge and the depth of my understanding of Scripture so I can share that depth with you and then pray for each other that God will give us the power of the Holy Spirit to live the Word perfectly to show perfect love to Jesus Christ. Now, Hebrews 1.5. Guys, read with me. Okay. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son. Thou art my son. This day I have begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now, why is this an important passage? If you remember my discussion with that Indian friend, whom I pray by the grace of Jesus Christ, repents and becomes a Trinitarian. Remember the guy said, wait, 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 wait. And by the way, one of the sisters in the Lord, I didn't know it was a sister. Her name is Taylor. 
I think Taylor, I forgot her name. She told me, you're being very rude. I didn't know it was a sister trying to chide me lovingly. She was she was rebuking me lovingly. I thought it was a dude. I said, if you don't like it, take take a hike and make sure the door hits you on the way out. Lord, help me to be more patient. Anyway, she goes, you're being very rude. You remember when he brought up begotten, being begotten? Remember, he goes, wait, 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 wait. My friend, wait. No, no, no. Wait, wait, wait. No, no, no. Okay. You can go listen to it if you don't believe me. This passage is used to show that Jesus is the begotten son in the sense that God brought Jesus into being, into life. Okay. This is what this passage is used to show. The passage is used to show that God brought Jesus into being, gave Jesus his life, so that Jesus didn't always exist. You understand the objection or no? So we can unpack it. Mahdi Bakhri, will you stick around for me to answer that? Then I show you from the Quran that Allah doesn't know everything, that Allah is an ignoramus. He's just as ignorant, illiterate as your prophet. And I'll use the Arabic to prove it. Or are you going to be scared or are you going to run? Don't block him, guys, by the way. Don't block him. So stick around. I'm going to answer it. Just stick around. Okay, now, Hebrews 1.5. How do we under how do we address Hebrews 1 5? You ready? How do we address Hebrews 1 5? In fact, because Mahdi is here, guys, can I go back to Mark 1332? Because Mahdi is a Muslim who thinks that Mark 1332 refutes the Trinity. Can I go to Mark 1332 with your permission? Because we'll still be addressing Mark 1332, but I want to do it now first so that we can kill two birds with one stone. Help him see how this proves Jesus is God and Muhammad is a false prophet, right? So now, if you want me to do that, help me to help him. Try not to engage him. Please, guys, please help me. It's not because I want to be a dictator. Too many comments, too many comments, and he's going to get lost in the shuffle. Let me address him. Don't address him. Let me address him. Uh, Muhammad, Allah is not God. He's a false God. He's a demon that inspired your prophet. If you don't like that, I'm sorry, friend. I'm not going to tickle your ears. If you don't like it, you can leave. Focus now. But let me deal with this guy by the grace of Jesus Christ. Okay, Mahdi. Mark 13, 32. I'm going to unpack it for you. I'm going to unpack it for you. Let's see if you're going to accept what it says. Let's see if you will. Okay. Guys, so help me and pray for me to refute his objection with the hopes so that he'll see the truth. If not... At least we refuted him. Okay, now, Mark 13, 32. Mahdi, get ready. I'm talking to you. But of the day and the hour, knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Okay, Mahdi, do you want me to address it? Then you're going to have to interact with me. Okay. Mahdi, do you believe God is the Father? Jesus said, neither the Son nor the Father. Do you believe God is the Father? Now, for some reason, when it's our... Okay, so no, Mahdi, he said no. Do you believe Jesus is the Son, Mahdi? He said, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father alone. Do you believe Jesus is the Son? No. So, Mahdi, do you understand that Mark 13, 32 proves Muhammad, your prophet, is an antichrist, the son of Satan? Because Jesus' words here is that he is the Son to the Father, and he's the unique Son to the Father, in contrast to humans and angels. So, you know, this verse just proved that Muhammad is a false prophet, a son of Satan, right? But do you agree? Do you accept Jesus' words and do you now condemn Muhammad? Say, I, Mahdi, condemn Muhammad as an antichrist, a son of Satan. It does matter because you're a Muslim. Why do you quote the words of Jesus and not believe them? Oh, you don't believe in it. So then why am I going to answer you? Why should I waste my time answering you if you don't believe what the verse says? Why should I waste time answering you if you don't believe what the verse says? Zach, do you want me to get you want to get bounced from the channel for asking such a stupid question? Seriously? No, it doesn't. My scriptures destroys Muhammad and buries Muhammad and shows that he's a dog of the devil. You didn't get that? My scriptures show that your your prophet is a satanic dog used of the devil to deceive people like you. You're not getting that? That's what my scriptures are doing. 
Now, second question, Mahdi. Second question for you. Mark 13, 32 says, no man knows, that's human beings, neither the angels of heaven. Now, according to Islam, no, you can't say my God is, is Satan. You know why, Mahdi? Your Quran says that you, you're supposedly, you worship my God. Chapter 29, verse 46 of the Quran. So you again showed Muhammad is a liar and he's a dog of the devil because you just said my God is Satan. But if my God is saying, then your, your Muhammad is a dog. He's worse than a dog because he said to tell you to say to me that your God and my God are the same. Chapter 29 was 46 of the Quran. So are you saying Muhammad is a dumb dog, an illiterate, stupid dog? Because you said my God is the devil, but he told you my God is your God? So Mahdi, what are you trying to prove? But you don't believe in the father. So wait, Mahdi, I want you to tell everyone, Allah's my father and the father of Muhammad. Yeah, you guys can't control yourself. Guys, control yourselves. Please, you're Christians, control yourself by the power of the Holy Spirit. Wait, but the God of Paul is the same God that you say sent Muhammad. You know why? Because your Quran says that the true followers of Christ were given victory over unbelievers till the day of resurrection. That's in chapter 3, verse 55 of the Quran, and chapter 61, verse 14. So Mahdi, chapter 3, verse 55, and chapter 61, verse 14 says that Allah gave the true followers of Jesus victory over the unbelievers, and they were uppermost and victorious, and they will be such till the day of resurrection. Are you saying that Paul defeated the followers of Christ? Paul destroyed the message of the followers of Christ? If you say yes, that means Paul is better and greater than your God, Allah. Now, Mahdi, I'm going to embarrass you. Quote to me one source that survived that shows that Jesus' followers were Muslims. Quote it. Show me. Because if your Quran is right, if your Quran is right, then that means the message of Jesus' followers prevailed and has been preserved, it isn't lost. Because that's what your fake Quran says. And you believe in your fake Quran. So give me a source that shows that there were followers of Jesus who were Muslims who believed like you. Quote the source. Quote the source. Give me the document. Give me the reference from these people who believe Jesus was just a man. Quote it. Because according to your Quran, their message survived and dominated. Show me that message. You're wasting our time here. You know, I'm going to embarrass you with the Ebionites, right? The Ebionites did not <clears throat> triumph. The Ebionites were not uppermost. The Ebionites vanished. And the Ebionites denied the virgin birth. And the Ebonites were vegetarians. So if they are the true followers of Jesus, you again buried Muhammad and showed Muhammad as the son of Satan because Muhammad said Jesus was born of the virgin. The Ebonites thought that Jesus was sired by Joseph. So are you sure the Ebonites are the Muslims? If they're the Muslims, then Muhammad is a fake. He turns out to be a son of Satan again. So you keep embarrassing Muhammad. So I'm waiting for the source, Mahdi. Give me the source of the followers of Christ that the Quran said became uppermost, victorious, and dominated, and their domination will remain till the day of resurrection. Show me their message. I'm waiting. Exactly, Saint. The Ebonites believe Jesus' death and resurrection. Mahdi, maybe you're illiterate like your prophet. Chapter 3, verse 55 of the Quran, Mahdi says, Jesus' followers became uppermost when Jesus was taken to heaven. Allah didn't wait for Muhammad to show up. Show me the true followers of Jesus from the time Jesus went to heaven up until the time of Muhammad. Who were they? What are their names? What is their message? And where can we find it? Show me the money. And I'm going to embarrass him further. I'm not going to quote his Muslim scholars that say that Paul was a true messenger of Christ. Here you go. Now I'm going to humiliate him. 
His own scholars admit Paul was a true follower of Jesus Christ. Here you go, folks. Here's the document. Here you go. You ready for the document? Guys, here's the document. Bulis, bulis. Now, Mahdi, you know I'm going to humiliate you further, right? And expose Muhammad for being a son of Satan. According to your Muslim scholars, Paul was a true follower of Jesus who accompanied Peter and went with Peter to Rome and was martyred for the cause of God. Let me show you. Bulis, bulis. You ready? Bulis. Let me get it to you. Here's the other article here. Here it is. Save these two articles, folks. I'm not talking out of your mother in my house. Okay. Are you ready now? Are you ready for Bulis? Bulis, alayhi salam. Bulis. Radiallahu anhu. Bulis, Bulis. Here you go. Tafsir al Quran al Adim by Ibn Abi Hatim. Ibn Abi Hatim. Tafsir al Quran al Adim. Bulis, Bulis, brother. Okay, here you go, guys. Can I quote? Here. It's Bulis. Shuayb al Jabai said the names of the two messengers where it is said we sent to them to are Simon and John, and the name of the third is Paul. They're quoting the chapter 32nd, 36th chapter of the Quran, Mahdi. Chapter 36 of the Quran, when it says the three messengers, your Muslim scholar said the three messengers were Simon, John, and Bulis. Paul. 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 No, you're lying, Mahdi. Most scholars say it was Bulis. I'm going to now embarrass you even more. Man, what a liar you are. Man, you're such a liar, bro. Me lying, me lying. Bulis, Bulis. Here you go. Bulis. From Shoaib al Jabai, he said, The name of the messengers who said, When we have sent them to, are Simon and John, and the name of the third is Paul. Let's have fun with this guy and expose Muhammad. Okay. Darju al Garar fi tafsir al Ayy wal Suwar by al Jurjani. Darju al Garar fi tafsir al Ayy wal Suwar al Jurjani. This is from al Jurjani. Bulis, bulis. My brother Bulis. Okay. Let me show you what he says. My brother Bulis. We can be here all day. Here you go. And Abdul Razak, in his tafsir, when we sent them to on the reign of Isa, they are Thomas and Paul. Mentioned in Zaad al Masr. Zaad al Masr. Wait, wait, wait. Who are the messengers? One of them was Paul, Bulis, brother, Bulis. If you guys wonder why I'm saying Bulis, Paul in Arabic is Bulis, Bulis, alayhi salam, Bulis, radiallahu anhu, Bulis, brother. His name was Bulis. Okay, Mahdi, should I continue embarrassing you? Or should we stop? Do you want me to further embarrass you or should we stop, brother, in humanity? Here's the article, guys. Did you save the links? Here it is. Here's the one article. I just posted it three times. Save the link. And here's the other article. I'm giving you two articles on Paul and Islam. Okay? Buddy, do you think we should stop now? Andy, can I now return to discussing the passages? And you want to just sit and listen? You're more than welcome to stay and listen as long as you don't distract. So can we stop now, Mahdi, and I can finish my session? I'm a liar. Okay, you want me to continue quoting more, uh, Mahdi? Do you want me to continue quoting more? Because you said I'm a liar. Do you want me to quote more? Guys, Revelation, I know you're itching, brother. You're, it's, you're itching. You need attention, Revelation 22, 13. You need to engage this guy. Okay? I'll give you attention, Revelation 22, 13, if you can control yourself. Let me deal with him. So you mean... All these dozens of scholars for your one scholar, huh? Okay, let me embarrass you further. Let me tell you what people said to those who denied that it's Paul. Okay, let me embarrass you now. Because you keep running your mouth, you don't listen. Bulis, brother. Bulis. Brother, brother like no other. 
Buddhist, man. Buddhist. Let me show you. See, your embarrassment to your prophet. And your prophet is embarrassment to humanity. Let me get it for you. Hold on. Brother, he's Buddhist, man. He's Buddhist. It's a long article, so let me just go through it. We were sailing along on the moonlight bay. Okay, here you go. He just said he can show us some, right? Okay. Aha. Let me show you what this Muslim scholar said. Here you go. What is the majority position? Tafsir Fath al Qadr by Al Shokhani. Al Shokhani. So show that you're a liar. Guys, read. Let me post it three times. And it is said, Simon and John and Paul, as is read by the majority with emphasis. Oh man, there goes your prophet. The majority of scholars say that it is Simon, John, and Paul. What was that about Tafsir al Kummi? Man, you got embarrassed. Your Kummi ain't gonna be Kummi anymore. Bullis, bullis, brother. Bullis. What is bullis? Radiallahu anhu. Okay. You caught it? Let me post it again because I know it takes a while. What was the majority view? What was the majority view of the scholars? Okay, where does Tafsir Ibn Abbas deny that Paul was there? And you keep mispronouncing it as Shalun when it's Shalun. Let me see. Maybe you're right. Maybe it's Shalun because you Muslims are illiterate, so you don't know how to pronounce names. Yeah, Shalun. I'm right. Shalun. So where does Tafsir Ibn Abbas say it's not Paul? See, I know you don't know logic. I know you don't know logic. To say that it's Shalom, Shalom, doesn't mean it's not Paul. He didn't say, no, it's not Paul. I know you don't know logic. Okay, now Mahdi, are you going to waste our time? Because you're wasting our time, kid. You're a little kid and you're wasting our time. Shalom. Okay. So are you going to sit here and listen? Okay, I'm a kid. Are you going to sit here and listen and not waste our time? Because we want to get back into the subject now. George, your ball-headed mother, George. What do you want me to say? Shalom. That was your ball-headed mother's name, George. Who cares who Shalom is? It's a fictional character, dude. Oh, Shal who? Shal na 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 na. Shal na na na. What what is what's wrong with you, dude? Who shall? Shall who? Shall who? Who, who, who? I gotta know. I gotta know. Dude, man. Damn, George. Dude, bro. George, don't you know that was your ball headed mother's maiden name? That's why she wears a wig, George. Shall who? What's wrong with you, dude? Calm down. Breathe. Here. George, with me. George, here, with me, George. Here, let's let's breathe together. Let's read. Let's breathe together and let's calm down. Repeat after me, George. Logos. 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 See, George, now you feel better, George? Is all, are you feeling better now, George? Feel better now? We okay, George? All right. Okay, George. Now we're okay, buddy. George. Okay. Now we're okay, buddy. Guy kept going after it. Shall who? Shall who? All right. My ball headed mother. Okay. That's true. All right. Okay. Now, with that said, let's get back to the topic. We're wasting time with Mahdi. But, folks, you understand how Mark 1332 destroyed Islam, right? You guys saw how Mark 1332 destroyed Islam because in it, Jesus is a son higher than angels and men. The unique son of the father. So God is the father and he's his unique son. And the father and the son are higher than angels and men. And the son is subject to the father. All of which Muhammad denied. All of which shows that Muhammad is a tool of the devil. You guys saw that? So what you're learning here, here's what you're learning. And I'm hoping that the spirit is using me to teach you. How not to debate and how to debate Muslims. Okay. How not to debate. And how to debate Muslims. You with me there? Yes, like someone just said. Shalun can also be an Arabic corruption of Shaul. Uh, uh, Shaul, meaning Paul. Saul. Shaul. Yeah. So even Shalun would be the Arabic corruption of, G uh, of Paul's Hebrew name. 
Shaul. So they couldn't say it, Shaul. So they said Shalom or Shalun. So either way, you end up with Paul. But anyway, try to explain it to him. No, it says Shalun, man. Others say it's Shalom. It didn't say Bulis. Anhu. Now, what you learn right now, see, this is what I'm saying. You're wasting with uh, your time with Mahdi. If you ask him who Shalun is, if you ask this clown, who is Shalun? What disciple of Jesus was named Shalun? Mahdi, what disciple of Jesus was named Shalun? And the prophet of Allah never mentioned Peter, John, James, Thomas. So who are the disciples of Jesus and what are their names? You see how stupid you are? You're, you're embarrassing Muhammad. Can you show me in the Quran where your God mentioned any of the names of Jesus' disciples? Give me the list of their names. Give me the list of their names. Tell me what their names are. But then why would you be so stupid to say the Prophet of Allah never mentioned Bulis when your prophet didn't know the names of any of Jesus' disciples. You see what you just did? You just embarrassed Muhammad again. You see what you just did again? You just embarrassed Muhammad again. You understand? Don't make comments defending your prophet that ends up embarrassing your prophet. So I'm going to give you a chance again. Do you want to sit and just let me finish my talk and listen? Or do you want to keep chiming in? Because every time you open your mouth, Muhammad gets exposed. And those honest Muslims who have eyes to see and ears to hear, see how wicked and filthy Muhammad was and leave him for Jesus Christ, their only hope of salvation. Praise the name of Jesus. Okay. Leonard, it's not really a waste of time because I'm going to teach you guys something, Leonard. Leonard, here's what I want to teach you. I want to teach you how not to debate the Muslims and how to debate the Muslims. So now this is all for you guys. Qurtubi is there too, Sai Christian, but he's going to reject it. You're wasting your time. Let me show you the way you debate a Muslim. Are you ready? Let me teach you, and then we'll go to Mark 13, 32 and finish that, and we'll go to Hebrews 1, 5. Are you ready to listen? Are you ready to listen? Okay. When a Muslim quotes a passage, please listen, because I'm trying to make you the best Christian apologist for the glory of Jesus. Not I, but the Holy Spirit using me to sharpen you to be the best for the glory of Christ. Here's what you do. When a Muslim quotes a passage, do two things. Not only answer the objection, but turn it against Muhammad, like I did. He quoted Mark 13, 32. What did I do? I turned it against Muhammad to show that Muhammad is an antichrist. Why? Because in Mark 13, 32, Jesus says he's the son of, Higher than men and angels, and God is the Father. Right there, you destroy Islam, you destroy Muhammad. Because if Jesus is the unique son to the Father, God is the Father, and Jesus is his unique son, and the son is higher than angels and men, Muhammad is exposed as a son of Satan and Antichrist, because Muhammad said Jesus is not God's son, and his God is not the Father. You see what I just did? You see what I just did? Now, notice how desperate he is. He goes, I don't believe it. I just quote to refute you. No, you actually helped me prove I can never be a Muslim. So, Mahdi, if your goal is to get Christians to become Muslims, you just destroyed any chance of us following your wicked, immoral prophet. Because the passage you quote shows me Muhammad contradicts the words of Jesus. So, Muhammad is the son of Satan. Thank you, Mahdi. Thank you so much. Guys, send them a flower. Thank you for quoting Mark 13, 32 to remind me Jesus is the son Higher than angels and men, belonging to the Father, subject to the Father, therefore proving Muhammad is the son of Satan because he contradicts Jesus. Thank you. Yay. Way to go. Al Masihu Akbar. Al Masihu Akbar. Al Masihu Akbar. Thank you, man. Yeah, baby. And I'm sorry. You know, I love you, sister, but please bear with me. Sometimes I have to say that. Do you want me to say it in, in another cadence? Okay, and how about if I say it like an opera singer? Did I help? 
So did you learn how to debate a Muslim? How do you debate a Muslim? You take their argument, turn against Muhammad, and answer it. Now let me answer it for the benefit of the rest of you. Are you ready? Can we now deal with Mark 13.32? Hey, you guys want me to do that again? The opera style of saying al Masih Akbar? Mahdi, you're a liar. If your goal is not to convert me to Islam, then you're a disgrace as a Muslim. Now notice this liar. Mahdi, your God tells you to convert me to Islam. So if your goal is not to make me a Muslim, then you are a disgrace, you're a munafik, you're a hypocrite, you're not a Muslim, you're a liar. Ya munafik. You wicked liar. So you got school. Okay, one more time. Anna, do you want me to do the opera version? And we're going to the passage. You want me to do the opera version again? If I can remember it. The opera one? Okay. Uh... Okay. How was that? Was that good? You know, this is the only YouTube channel, the only live stream where you get such entertainment. Now notice, folks, glory to the Holy Spirit, you're getting seminary level education and entertainment for free. You cheap penny punching. Anyway, just kidding. Yes. No. No, no, no. Wait, 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 wait. No, no, no. Wait, wait, wait. Surprise, David. All right. Let's unpack Mark 13, 32. <clears throat> and then we go to Hebrews 1, 5. Mahdi, do you care what the personal name of God is? Do you care? Mahdi, do you really care? Guys, should I ignore him or should I continue to engage him? Should I just ignore him or should I continue to engage him? Drakalo. Continue. Engage him. Some saying engage. Uh, Mahdi, what's the name of your God? What's the name of your God? Mahdi, what's the name of your God? Hold on, let me let me engage this guy. He's gonna waste time. All right. Yeah, maybe we can get him to Skype. You want to Skype me, Mahdi? But he's not gonna answer questions on Skype. He's gonna talk over me. Wow, what a brilliant genius Einstein this guy is. He says, The name of my God is God in any language. What a gen man, you're an Einstein. You are a genius, man. You see what he said? The name of my God is God in any language. You are a genius, bro. Right there, you've refuted me. And I cannot debate ever again because you schooled me, son. I can't do apologetics anymore because I've never heard such an amazing answer. The name of my God is God in any language. Wow. That means the name of your God is Zeus. Zeus. The name of your God is Baal, Baal. The name of your God is Jupiter. The name of your God is uh, is Krishna and Vish. You are a genius, man. Genius. Marvelous genius. Anyway, goes. Anyway, guys, we're wasting our time. No, I'm hey, he said it. The name of my God is your the name of my God is God in any language. Genius, man. Genius. Wow. Genius. Okay, folks, let's come back. Guys, ignore him. Now, mods, use your discretion whether he's a nuisance and you want to block him. That's up to you. Okay, now let's come back to the issue. Mark 13, 32. Let's deal with that. Do you guys want me to finish Mark 13, 32, or do you want me to go to Hebrews 1, 5? Mark 13, 32, or Hebrews 1, 5? Should I finish Mark 13, 32, or go back to Hebrews 1, 5? Let me see. Okay, Mark 13. I got more for Mark 13.32. Okay, let's go back to Mark 13.32. Okay, let's finish it. Let's go there. Let's go to Mark 13.32. Let's finish it. But of the day and the hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son but the Father. Now, let me show you why this is an astonishing assertion, an astonishing statement. 
Most people read Mark 13, 32 and get shocked. Now, here's where I need you Christians to listen. I've discussed this in the past. I'm going to discuss it again. And I know I'm going to discuss it in the future. People focus more on Jesus saying that the son doesn't know the dare hour and they get shocked. But wait, guys, pay attention to the text carefully as I unpack it. We're going to go into some meat. Are you ready for the meat? Pay attention to the text as I unpack it. Okay. Notice what Jesus is saying. No man can know the dear hour. No man. So notice there's an ascendancy. An ascendancy. Right? Where we go from the lower to the greater. No man on earth knows the dear hour. Now that's to be expected because God remains hidden to man on earth. Unless God chooses to appear to us visibly or in a dream or vision, then God remains hidden to man. He's in secret. We don't see him. So it's to be expected that human beings on earth who don't hear God's voice audibly or see him visibly would not know the their hour. Go to Math Matthew 6, 6 and 18. Matthew 6, verse 6 and 18. Matthew 6, verse 6. And 18. Watch here. Watch here. Matthew 6, verse 6 and 18. Thank you, guys. Thank you for this. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father, which is in secret. And thy father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. That thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy father, which is in secret. And thy father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. Did you catch it? Your father is in secret, meaning hidden. You can't see him visibly. You can't hear him audibly. So unless God reveals the dare hour, it's to be expected that men on earth who don't see God visibly or hear him audibly wouldn't know. And then he says, neither the angels of heaven. You know why that's astonishing? Go to 1 Kings twenty two nineteen. 19. 1 Kings twenty two nineteen. 19. My neighbor's blasting the music. I might have to get my earplugs. 1 Kings 22, 19. Watch here. Understand what Jesus is saying. Let me unpack the meat of it. 1 Kings 22, 19. And he said, Hear thou, therefore, the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the hosts of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. Now notice, unlike humans, the angelic host, the hosts of heaven, have direct access to God's visible glory and presence. They see God visibly and they hear him audibly. Do you see that? 1 Kings 22, 19. They see God visibly and hear him audibly. You catch it? They are standing to the right and left. And if you read 20 to 23, he talks to them. And they see him and hear him audibly. <clears throat> Let's go to Daniel 7, verses 9 to 10. Daniel 7, verses 9 to 10. Watch here. Daniel 7, verses 9 to 10. Watch here. Daniel 7, verses 9 to 10. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did seat, sit, whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like the pure wool. Now watch this. His throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. Did you catch it again? All of the spirit creatures numbering in the thousands stand before God, standing in attention, ready to serve him. So they see God visibly on the throne, and they hear him audibly. Are you, guys, are you following me, or am I confusing you guys? You guys are not talking about denominations and what you're... See, you guys really disrespectful, not paying attention, but oh well. Focus. Focus, guys. Please. All right. Isaiah 6, verses 1 to 5. Thank you, guys. Joe, John, everyone else. Thank you for the super chat. God bless you. Isaiah 6, verses 1 to 5. You're not so great, Darius. Just remember that. Isaiah 6, verse 1 to 5. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and a chain filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. 
With Twain, he covered his face. And with Twain, he covered his feet. And with Twain, he did fl fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Now pay attention to five. Pay attention to five. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. My eyes have seen him. You see why Isaiah is shocked? Because human beings typically do not see God visibly. Isaiah was honored in that the veil of heaven was removed, and he saw with his own physical eyes the Lord God Almighty appearing visibly on a throne, appearing in a visible shape. What's the point? Humans on earth do not see God unless God wants to show himself to an individual or to a group of people like he did with Israel. Typically, humans on earth do not see God visibly or hear him audibly. The angels, on the other hand, thank you, Chris. The angels, on the other hand, do see God like the seraphim. Even though they cover their face because he's too glorious, they know that's God on the throne. They hear his voice and they serve and obey. Okay, now Luke 119. Luke 119. Gabriel says to Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, Luke 119. Okay, watch here. Luke 119. And the angel answered and said unto him, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God, and I'm sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. Okay. I am Gabriel. I stand before the presence of God. Okay. Now, you understand Jesus' point? Human beings on earth don't know that they're our. Well, that's to be expected because they don't see God visibly or hear God audibly. He can do that for individuals, but that's not the normal way that God speaks to us. God doesn't just show up and speak to us audibly and appear visibly, right? He speaks through the scriptures. He sp speaks through the mouths of two or three witnesses, believers. He can appear to you in a dream or vision. But typically the way God speaks to us is by leaving impressions in our minds, in our hearts, through the word, the Bible, or through Christians. Angels, on the other hand, angels, on the other hand, angels, on the other hand, do have access to God. They see him visibly in heaven on a throne in a visible shape and hear his voice audibly. So what is Jesus' point? You ready for his point? What is Jesus' point? He's saying even angels who are higher than men for now, even angels who are higher than men for now, who have direct access to God, his visible glory, his visible presence, and hear his voice in heaven, something that human beings are not privy to. Even they don't know that they're our. Even they don't know that they're our. You get it now? You understand what he just said? Even angels. Now remember, because of the sin of Adam and Eve, we lost the glory that God created man to possess, and we became lower than the angels and glory and rank. And then Jesus restores us to the position that God crowned man with before the fall. But I want you to get it now. I hope you're getting it. Human beings don't know that they're our. Okay. Neither the angels. Oh, wow. You mean the angels in God's presence who see God visibly and hear his voice don't know? No. Now, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, all you super chatters. God bless you. Okay. Understand why this is shocking to a Jew. To a first century Jew, when you speak of angels and men, you mean all of creation. Pay attention, folks. If you don't pay attention, you're not going to get it. And I want you to get it. I want to serve you for the sake of Jesus to know your Bible. Have no doubt your Bible is God's word. Understand it and live it in the power of the Holy Spirit and proclaim it for the glory of Jesus. So please let me know that I'm accomplishing my goal. Okay. Now, according to the biblical worldview, the Jewish mindset, when you speak of angels and humans, that's all of creation. That's the entire created order. That's the entire created order. You with me there? Because when you speak of creation among sentient beings, beings that have cognition, awareness, that are in fellowship with God, that's angels and men. Right? 
We put animals aside, plants aside, marine life aside. When you talk about creation, sentient beings, meaning beings with intelligence and awareness that can have fellowship with God and speak to God, that's angels and men, that's all of creation. So basically what Jesus just said, said here is, no creature in all of creation knows of their hour. So that's it. So now when you mention all creation, there's only one category left. When you mention all creation, there's only one category left. You guys are not blocking this guy for using the F word here? Okay, Mods, I don't know what you're doing, and you unmuted it? So from a Jewish perspective, angels and men, humans, that's all creation. What's left? What's the only category left? If that's creation, what's left now? What's left? You unhit him, Ariel. Hide him again. God. Uncreated. Creator. Now notice where Jesus puts himself, folks. You have creation, angels and men. That's all creation here. There's only one category. God. Uncreated creator. Now let's see where Jesus put himself. Mark 13, 32. Exactly, non-creation. Let's see where Jesus put himself. Okay. Mark 13, 32 again. Let's see. Where did he put himself? But of the day and the hour knoweth no man ascending. No, not the angels which are in heaven. That's all creation. Nor the Son, but the Father alone. Jesus just claimed to be the Son who transcends angels and humans, meaning he transcends creation, and he belongs to God uniquely as a Son. Notice in that list, He's the son to the father. He's the son who makes God the father. No, it didn't say son of man, faith. Oh, did you catch it? Where did Jesus place himself? In the category of created things or in the category of God? Because he in that list is the son that makes God the father. He's a unique son to the father. So he belongs to the father, not to creation. Some Christians, when they come up with arguments by Muslims, they really show me that they don't know the Bible. And it's a shame because they allow Muslims to disgrace them. This guy here, I don't know whether I should chew him out for being that stupid to mention that a Muslim says Adam's the son of God, Luke 338, and not understand the difference. But anyway, let me ignore him for now. If you understand? So even in that statement, even in that passage where Jesus says he doesn't know the dare hour, he still claims to be superior to all creation, distinct from all tree creation, transcends all creation, and belongs in the same category of existence that his father belongs to. He belongs to the category of God, not creation, because he's the son to the father in that list, right? And he belongs to the same side that the father belongs to, distinct from creation. You with me there? Bible, you need to go, buddy. You need to get out of this uh, session. Send Bible out of here, please. I don't want him here. Sorry, guys. He's got to go, too. Sorry, guys. All right. You with me there? You got it? Okay. Now, second point to remember. Second point to remember. Mark 13 is not the start of the gospel. Mark 13 is in the middle of the gospel. In the middle of the gospel, right? Actually, it's near the end. It's not even the middle because three chapters later it ends. Do you think Mark wants you to skip chapters 1 to 12, jump into Mark 13, and take a verse out of context in order to make Mark say something about Jesus he didn't intend to say? Or does he assume you've read Mark 1, 2, 3, 4, you've read all the chapters preceding by the time you came to Mark 13 to understand his point? So... Let's see how Mark begins the gospel. Let's see how Mark begins the gospel. 
Does he begin by identifying Jesus as a creature? Or does he begin by identifying Jesus as the human enfleshment of the God of Israel? That he's the God of Israel in the flesh. If he's the God of Israel in the flesh, then he must be all-knowing. Because to be the God of Israel means you're omniscient. Let's see. Let's go to Mark 1. Let's read verses 1 to 4. I hope I'm not boring you with this stuff, guys. I hope it's not boring. Let me get something to drink. I hope it's blessing you, even though you may have heard it in the past. I hope those of you who have already heard this, still, the more you hear it, the better. Let me just get something to drink. Mark 1, verses 1 to 4. Mark 1, verses 1 to 4. Just let me get a drink. Al Masihu, Akbar. Akbar, 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 Right, so thank you, Antoine. Mark 1, verses 1 of 4. Let's begin. Are we ready? The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written, folks, pay attention. As it is written, in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now, verse 4. John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now, guys, pay attention to what you just read. Mark begins his gospel saying, this gospel of Jesus Christ, this good news of Jesus Christ, was announced in the Old Testament. Was announced in the Old Testament. The Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament prophets, the Old Testament prophets, announce the good news of Jesus Christ. Okay, pay attention to what Mark says. And then he quotes two Old Testament passages. As it is written in the prophets, in Mark 1, 2, he quotes Malachi 3, verse 1. And in Mark 1, 3, he quotes Isaiah 40, verse 3. Now, do me a favor, Protestant. Post Mark 1, 2, back to back with Malachi 3, verse 1. No, Anna, your sister, you're not paying attention. He used the F word. He said, F Muhammad. Do you say that? Do you, at your own privacy, say F Muhammad? So you have a foul mouth? Mark 1, 2, and Mark, uh, Malachi 3, 1. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Now pay attention to, verse, to Malachi 3, verse 1. Malachi 3, verse 1. Pay attention. This is where Mark is quoting. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, you understand the prophecy? Folks, if you don't get it now, I'm going to lose you. Okay. Mark says Malachi 3.1 is fulfilled in the life of Jesus. Mark says Malachi 3.1 is about Jesus. Now, what you see what Malachi 3.1 just said? Okay, Malachi 3.1 just said. It said, a messenger will be sent. Pay attention, br brethren. A messenger will be sent. He will be sent ahead of the Lord to prepare for the Lord's coming to his temple. It says, after the messenger comes, the Lord whom you seek will come to his temple, the angel of the covenant whom you people desire, says the Lord of hosts. So notice what's happening here. God says, I want to send a messenger. That messenger prepares for the coming of the Lord who comes to his temple, who's the angel of the covenant. So this messenger is going to prepare people for the coming of who? The angel of the covenant, who is the Lord, for whom the temple belongs. This guy, Elijah. What do I say to Chris Marcos here? <sighs> By your strength, help me, Lord Jesus. Control, control myself, overcome, to learn patience. Transform me, become more like Christ in Jesus' name. All right. Anyway, did everyone understand? Yeah, Chris Marcos, when I show you it's not Elijah, will you leave my channel and not come back? 
when I show you that it's not Elijah, will you never come back to my channel? Would you make that promise to me? Would you promise me not to come back to my channel, brother, and help me be happier in life? Would you? Okay, now. Okay, you're not going to promise me? Okay, then. All right, thank you. Now, listen to the prophecy again. God is saying, I'm going to send a messenger to prepare for the Lord who's coming to his temple, who's the angel of the covenant. The phrase, the Lord, in Malachi, in Malachi 3, 1, the Lord, it's ha-adon, adon. Now, some transliterate it differently. Let me break this down, man. Let me break it down. If I don't break it down, we're going to get nowhere. Okay. Okay. Watch here. Let me give you the interlinear. Let me give you the interlinear. Okay, here you go. Click here. Click here, guys. Can you confirm the, the words, the Lord is ha-adon? Now, they transliterated differently. That's okay. But can you confirm that? Can you click on that link and confirm it for yourselves? Can you confirm that for yourselves? Before I move on? Did you confirm it? Okay, did everyone see it? Okay, good. You know why? The phrase ha-adon, ha-adon, those two words are only used for Jehovah. They're never used for a creature. Ha-adon, only used for Jehovah, never used for a creature. Let me show you where it's used for Jehovah God. Isaiah 124. Isaiah 124. Watch here. Isaiah 124. Let's break it down. Therefore, saith the Lord. Guess what the Hebrew words the Lord happened to be? Therefore, saith the Lord, Ha Adon. Who? Yahovah, Jehovah of hosts, the mighty one of Israel. Ah, I will ease me of mine adversaries and avenge me of mine enemies. Do you catch it? There, Jehovah of hosts, the mighty one, is said to be Ha Adon. Right there. The Lord, those two words, the Lord. Hebrew, Ha Adon. Ha Adon. So Jehovah's Ha Adon. Those two words, Ha Adon, are only used of Jehovah, no one else. Now, Isaiah 3, verse 1. Okay. Isaiah 3, verse 1. Guys, do remind me to give you links to articles before I end the session. For behold, there it is again, the Lord. Guess what it is in Hebrew? Ha-Adon. Ha-Adon. Jehovah of hosts doth take away from Jerusalem, from Judah, the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread, and the whole stay of water. Why is that significant? Because this messenger is sent to prepare for Ha-Adon. Who's Ha-Adon? According to the Old Testament, that's Jehovah. So the messenger comes preparing the people for the coming of the Lord, Jehovah. Further proof that Lord is Jehovah, Malachi 3.1 said, the Lord who comes to his temple. The temple in Jerusalem was built for Jehovah alone. First Chronicles 29 verse 1, it wasn't built for man. It's the Lord, Sargon. You have to have the definite article, the, before it. The Lord. Okay. Was the temple built for man or for God? Furthermore, David the king said unto the congregation, Solomon my son, whom alone God hath chosen, is yet young and tender, and the work great for the palace, the temple in Jerusalem, is not for man, but for the Lord God, for Jehovah God. So is everyone on the same page with me? The Lord who's coming to his temple, Ha Adon, Ha Adon, those words only use of Jehovah, and the temple belongs to Jehovah alone. So the Lord is coming to his temple. Do you want more proof that this is Jehovah God? That the messenger is being sent to prepare for the coming of Jehovah God? That when the messenger shows up, that means right after him, the Lord of the temple will show up who is Jehovah? 
Clear? So far, are you with me? But now no, notice who this Lord is. Let's go to Malachi 3.1. Who this Lord is. Let's go to Malachi 3.1. Notice who he is. He's Jehovah, but which person of the Godhead? Which person of the Godhead? And here's where you don't catch it. Notice Malachi 3.1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. Messenger of the covenant. Folks, the word messenger in Hebrew is malach. That's the same word angel. That's the same word angel. Okay. So messenger of the covenant means the angel of the covenant. Angel of the covenant. In other words, the Lord who's coming to his temple is the angel of the covenant. What angel of what covenant? Judges chapter 2 verses 1 to 5. Judges chapter 2 verses 1 to 5. Judges chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. Watch here. What angel of what covenant? Watch here, folks. Judges 2, verses 1 to 5. Thank the mods for helping me to help you. And an angel of the Lord, the angel, the Hebrew word is malach, same word, malach, the messenger of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I, notice how the angel speaks, folks. Guys, pay attention, be blown away. For the glory of Jesus. Notice this angel speaking. Notice what the angel says. I made you to go up out of Egypt. And have brought you unto the land. Which I swore unto your fathers. Wait. The angel saying. I brought you Israelites out of Egypt. And the land that I gave you. Is the one I swore unto your fathers. And I said I will never break. My covenant with you. The angel is the one who made the covenant with Israel. The angel is the one who promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he'd give the land to their descendants. And it's the angel who brought them out of Egypt into the land. That's what the angel is claiming here. And ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Why have you done this? Oh, but wait. Hold on. Okay. Wherefore, I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their God shall be a snare unto you. And it came to pass when the angel of the Lord Jehovah spake these words unto all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and wept. And they called the name of that place Bochim, and they sacrificed the, there unto Jehovah, the Lord. Wait, the angel says, it's my covenant I made with you. It's the promise I swore to your fathers. I brought you out of the land of Egypt and into the promised land. And I told you, have nothing to do with inhabitants, but you didn't obey my voice. So now I'm going to punish you. Who does this angel think he is? Let me show you another reference to the angel being God. Judges 13, 21, 22. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I have sessions on the angel of the Lord. Okay. So I'm just going to show you who the angel of the covenant is. Judges 13, 21 and 22. Chris, you know you got to go now, right? Hey, guys, send Chris out of here, please. Please, he's got to go. Honestly, no, I can't tolerate this guy. He's got to go. But the angel of the Lord did no more appear to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was an angel of the Lord. Now notice, Manoah knew the man standing before him was the angel of the Lord. But now notice what he says in 22. And Manoah said unto his wife, you, we shall surely die because we have seen God. We shall surely die because we have seen God. But folks, 21 says, Manoah knew he was seeing the angel of God in human form. He knew that man was the angel of God. And he knew that this was the angel of God in human form. Why then did Manoah say, we saw God when we looked at the angel. And because we saw God, we're going to die, which he didn't die. Wait, Manoah, you know that's the angel of God, right? Yes. Why did you say we've seen God when you know it's the angel? And you know his answer is? Because the angel is God. He's not a creature. This angel 
is sent by God. He appears as a man, and he's God, and he's the God of Israel. Did you catch it? Judges 13, 21, 22, he said it. Manoah knew that it was the angel of the Lord. We shall surely die. We've seen God. But wait, the man you saw is the angel of the Lord. Yes. So you know it's the angel of the Lord? Yes. So what makes you think you're looking at God? And his answer is because he is God. Messenger angel sent by God who's not a creature, who appears as a man who's God. But folks, let me remind you. Malachi 3.1 says, the Lord who's coming to his temple is the angel of the covenant. In other words, Malachi 3.1 is telling us the angel of God, the angel of the Lord, who is sent by God, who happens to be God, who is the Lord of the temple, is going to show up after the messenger appears to prepare for his coming. According to Mark 1, you know who that messenger was? Who was the messenger sent to prepare for the Lord coming to his temple, who is the angel of the covenant? John the Baptist. That's why in Mark 1, 4, Mark mentioned John the Baptist. Okay, now. Let's do the math here. John the Baptist is the messenger of Malachi 3.1. John the Baptist, when he shows up, he's going to prepare people for the coming of the Lord, words only used of Jehovah, to his temple, a temple built only for Jehovah, who happens to be angel of the covenant, meaning the angel of the Lord. John, you're that messenger? Yes. Who would you come to prepare for? Jesus. Wait. If Jesus is the one you came to prepare for, John, but you're the messenger who was sent to prepare for the Lord coming to his temple, the angel of the covenant. Are you telling me Jesus is the Lord, Ha Adon? The temple belongs to him and he's the angel of the covenant, the angel of God in the Old Testament? Yes, that's who he is. What do you make? Mech and beauties. Oh, but wait. Now let's see the second prophecy. The second prophecy he quoted. The second prophecy he quoted. Mark 1, 3 with Isaiah 40, verse 3. Mark 1, 3 with Isaiah 40, verse 3. Mark 1, 3 with Isaiah 40, verse 3. Watch here. Watch the second. Second prophecy. I don't know what Tom is asking because I can't go off topic right now. Now watch. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now notice, Mark just quoted Isaiah 40 verse 3. Pay attention. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now notice Isaiah 40 verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. This is where Mark is quoting from. Isaiah 40 verse 3. The voice in the wilderness cries out, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Notice the word Lord is all capitals. In Hebrew, it's prepare ye the way of Yahovah. Yod, he, vav, he. Prepare thee the way of the Jehovah. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. The voice in the wilderness is preparing Israel for the coming of Jehovah, their God. Get ready. Our God is coming. Get ready. The Lord Jehovah is going to show up. Okay, now let's go to Mark 1, 3 and 4. Mark 1, verses 3 and 4, to see who the voice in the wilderness is. Mark 1, verses 3 to 4, who is the voice that cries out in the wilderness, telling people Jehovah's coming, our God is going to show up. Mark 1, verses 3 and 4. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John did baptize in the wilderness. Wow. Is it a coincidence that after Mark quotes these prophecies and mentions the voice in the wilderness crying out, he then refers to John in the wilderness baptizing and preparing people to repent for the one to come. John the Baptist is in the wilderness. The voice that cries out, Jehovah's coming, get ready for our God, is in the wilderness. The voice cries out in the wilderness. John the Baptist cries out in the wilderness. Why? John is the voice in the wilderness of Isaiah 40, verse 3, the messenger of Malachi 3.1, sent to tell people 
the Lord Ha'adon is coming to his temple, who is the angel of the covenant, the angel of God, who is Jehovah, our God. Right? Did you catch it? So according to Mark, John is the messenger of Malachi 3.1. And the voice in the wilderness, Isaiah 40, verse 3. But the one to come is the Lord, Ha'adon, to his temple, a temple built for the worship of Jehovah, who's the angel of the covenant, who is Jehovah, our God. That means God Almighty, the God of Israel, was to show up right after John appeared. But then he asked John, uh, John, John who's going to show up? Jesus. Jesus? The prophecies say... Our God is going to show up. Jehovah is going to show up. The Lord who owns the temple is going to show up. Who's the angel of the covenant? Yeah, exactly. That's who Jesus is. So wait, Jesus is Jehovah, our God, the Lord who owns the temple in Jerusalem, the angel of the covenant, the angel of God? Yes. But if Jesus is Jehovah, our God, then he's uncreated by nature. He's eternal. He's almighty. He's all-knowing. Yes. But then why is it in Mark 13, he doesn't know the their hour? You see the point now? Do you see, you see the point now? So if Mark has begun his gospel, if Mark has begun his gospel by identifying Jesus as the God of Israel, Jehovah, Israel's God, coming in the flesh, who is Ha'adon, the Lord, coming to his temple. The temple belongs to Jesus, and he's the angel of the covenant, meaning that angel of God that appeared as a man who claimed to be God and was worshipped as God, sent by God. You're telling me that Mark wants to deny that Jesus is God Almighty? So you're going to skip Mark 1 and Mark 2 and Mark 3 and Mark 4 and Mark 5, skip all those chapters, Go to Mark 13, pull out a verse out of context to try to deny what Mark has already established in the 12 pre previous chapters, that Jesus is Jehovah God the Son, Jehovah God the Son in the flesh. That was, that's what you want to do, do to me? Now let me prove to you that Mark and John the Baptist are Trinitarians. I'm just going to use Mark 1. Mark and John the Baptist are Trinitarians. Mark 1, verses 9 to 11. Watch here. Watch here, guys. Mark 1, verses 9 to 11. I'm going to answer the question by Tom. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in the Jordan. And straightway, right away, coming up out of the water, he saw the heaven open, split asunder. He saw the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. So the spirit appears visibly in visible shape, the shape of a dove. So John sees the spirit in visible shape, shape of a dove. So there's the spirit. So here's Jesus. Here's the spirit. Spirit comes down on him. So the spirit is not Jesus. Jesus is not the spirit. But then I'll watch 11. And there came a voice from heaven saying, thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So now you have the father saying to Jesus, you're my son whom I love. So Jesus is not the father. And you, I'm well pleased. Father in heaven, John hears his voice audibly. The spirit comes down in visible shape, in the shape of a dove, and rests on Jesus. Father, spirit, and son. But Mark 1, verses 1 to 8, established Jesus as Jehovah God Almighty of the Old Testament. So if Jesus is Jehovah God in the flesh, but he's not the Father, and the Father is Jehovah God, and the Spirit is the eternal Spirit, no wonder we are Trinitarians. Welcome to the wonderful world of the Trinity. The Father is definitely Jehovah God. But Mark has just identified Jesus as Jehovah God in the flesh, the Son of the Father, and the Spirit is distinct from both. You see why we're Trinitarians, folks? You see why we are Trinitarians? You catch it? 
And that's all in Mark 1. Now, let me show you from Mark 2, again, further proof that Jesus is God. I'm going to wrap up Mark 13, 32, and I think Tom had a question about the difference in the reading. Okay. Mark 2, verses 1 to 4. Yep, and the temple is his father's house, and it belongs to him. Mark 2, verses 1 to 4. Let's unpack it. Watch here. I hope I'm not boring you guys here. Are you guys bored? I hope not. I hope it's still blessing you and we keep most of you. Mark 2, verses 1 to 4. And again, he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. And straightway, right away, immediately, many were gathered together insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them, and they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, meaning a paralytic, which was born of four. So four people carried him. Watch, guys. This should move you in your spirit, make you cry, dude. Even if you've heard this dozens of times, your heart should always be filled afresh with deep love for Jesus that even when you hear something over and over again, it shall still move you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Watch this, guys. Watch this. Watch. Verse 4. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof. They couldn't enter through the door, so they went to the roof and destroyed a man's property. That's how zealous they were in trying to read Jesus because they had no doubt if we get to Jesus, he'll be healed. And there's nothing going to stop us from getting to Jesus. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. Practical application. These men loved their friends so much. They knew if we get him to Jesus, he'll be healed because we know Jesus. Now, guys, no. Learn, learn from these men. They had no doubt that Jesus is full of love and compassion and mercy. And they had no doubt that Jesus had the power to heal. And because he's a loving, compassionate, merciful Savior, he would heal that man. And they had no doubt. And not only did they have no doubt, they resolved nothing will stop us from getting to Jesus. Nothing. We have to get to Jesus. We have to bring him to Jesus because Jesus is the only hope of his healing and salvation. And there's nothing that will stop us from getting to Jesus, not even a crowd. If it means we have to bust someone's property, destroy someone's property, get to Jesus, we'll do it. You see the zeal? Because of that, now notice what our Lord says, Mark 2, verse 5. Mark 2, verse 5. Watch this. Mark 2, verse 5. Pay attention here. Watch now. When Jesus saw their faith, bam. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, before I move on to the rest of it, notice faith is not simply mental assent. Faith is much more than saying, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Faith is is a wholehearted trust in Jesus that results in action. Faith moves you to action. Faith produces actions that go with your faith. It's not simply mental ascent. Faith is a living, dynamic trust in Jesus that results in you doing whatever it takes to get to Jesus and doing whatever the master asks of you to do. That is true faith. And so Jesus wants to see your faith, not hear your faith. He doesn't want you to say, I believe. He wants to see that you believe. And how does Jesus see it? Even though he has access to your heart, he sees it by your deeds. Because notice it says, when Jesus saw their actions, they truly believe in me because nothing could stop them from reaching me. And they went out of their way, even destroying another man's property to get to me. That's how much trust they had in me and how much faith they had in me that I can do what they believe I'm able to do. You caught it? So what's the practical application of this? 
Jesus wants to see our faith, not just hear you talk about it. Let me see your faith. It's not simply confidence, it's trust. See, Bozak, when you trust someone, you'll do whatever that person tells you to do, right, Bozak? It's trusting in him. Right? So I hope that's clear. But now notice what our Lord did. Notice what our Lord did. He didn't heal the man's physical disease. He healed his spiritual disease. Son, your sin are forgiven you. Do you know why? Because to the Lord, what's more important? To be healed physically and still be paralyzed spiritually and on your way to hell? Or to be healed spiritually and remain physically paralyzed because your physical paralysis is temporary. Because when Jesus returns, he will destroy all disease, all sickness, all ailments, all paralysis. That will be past. That will never, ever occur again in the new heavens, new earth. So the Lord wants to see you healed of your spiritual disease because your physical ailment will be taken care of Ultimately, when he returns, where he transforms your bodies to be disease-free, deathless, death-free, and incorruptible. But what matters is you be forgiven spiritually so then you can dwell in bodies that are deathless. Because if you are dead in sin, paralyzed by sin, then your soul and body will be damned to hell. You want me there? So he went to the heart of the matter. Jesus showed them what the real concern was. As much as you love him, I love him more. And I'm more concerned about his soul because his paralysis is temporary. At the resurrection, he won't be paralyzed. But if he remains spiritually paralyzed, then it will be cut off from the presence of God. So as much as you love him, I love him more to deal with the real disease, his spirit, sin disease, and heal him spiritually. You with me there? Is it making sense? Now, where does this prove that Jesus is God? Mark 2, 5 to 8. Mark 2, 5 to 8. Where does this prove that Jesus is God? Watch here. Watch here. Mark 2, verses 5 to 8. Pay attention to how this proves Jesus God. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now notice, guys. Mark 2, 5 to 8, 6, 7. Watch. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Why is he blaspheming who can forgive sins but god alone but god only pay attention god only now notice what our lord does and immediately when jesus perceived in his spirit guys pay attention to the language how did he perceive this in his spirit and i'll explain what that means that's markin's way of referring to his divine nature in his spirit that they so reason within themselves they weren't saying this out loud they weren't verbalizing this they were thinking this in their hearts. He said unto them, why reason ye these things in your hearts? Wow. Talk about meat. I hope you're not bored and you, you're still excited because I got more to unpack. Wait. They didn't verbalize this. This was something they said in themselves, in their hearts. But immediately when they said it, Jesus knew by a spirit this is what they're thinking. So he says, why do you reason these things in your hearts? So Jesus knew what they were thinking in their hearts, knew their thoughts, number one. Jesus forgives sins, number two. Number three, he heals diseases. Mark 2, verses 9 to 12. Mark 2, verses 9 to 12. Your dad, you mean your heavenly father, Pedro? Mark 2, verses 9 to 12. Whether is it easier to say, he's telling them, what's easier to say to the paralyzed, sick of palsy? Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and take up thy bed and walk. Now, pay attention to 10. Pay attention to 10. But that you may know 
that the Son of Man, I, the Son of Man, hath power on earth to forgive sins, that you may know that I do have the power, the ability to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, right? I say unto thee, arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them, before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw, saw it on this fashion. Now notice what Jesus did. It's easy for me to say your sins are forgiven you because you can't prove or disprove it, right? Because the forgiveness of sins is something spiritual that physical eyes cannot see. It's spiritual. It's something done to your inner person that physical eyes cannot see. But if there's a man who's paralyzed and I say, get up and walk, that will either end up humiliating me or confirming my words. Because if I say, get up and walk, he doesn't walk. I just expose myself as a charlatan. So what did Jesus do? Jesus said, I'm now going to do a physical miracle before your eyes that you will see and cannot de deny to then show you that you can take me at my word and trust me when I say that I can do things for you that you cannot verify with your senses. This physical miracle that you will see should confirm you to trust me in those areas in your life that I'm in control over but you cannot see proof of it. What Jesus is saying is, this miracle should assure you to trust me in those areas that cannot be verified by your senses. I'm going to do something that you can verify with your sense of sight, even touch, you can touch them. So you can trust me in those areas that you have no access of verifying with your senses, with sight, Sound, taste, smell, or hearing. You want me there? And why did he do that miracle? To confirm to them and us, I have the power to forgive all sins if you trust me and turn to me, as they did. Okay, so now notice the three things. Three things. Jesus forgives sins, heals diseases, and knows what people are thinking in their hearts. Jesus forgives sins, heals diseases, and knows what people are thinking in their hearts. Let's go now to 1 Kings 8.39. Get ready. Well, you guys already know this. So I don't know if I'm blowing you away. 1 Kings 8.39. Watch here. 1 Kings 8.39. Thank you, SD. Well, here we have a Muslim saying, I'm the best encyclopedia on the Trinity. Thank you, friend. Even though you keep attacking, distracting, thank you. 1 Kings 8.39. Then hear thou in heaven, Solomon praying to God. Then hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and forgive. Who forgives? God. Forgive. And do... And give to every man according to his ways, whose heart thou knowest, for thou, even thou only, knowest the hearts of all the children of men. You alone, God, know the hearts of all the children of men, and you forgive sins. Jesus forgives sins and knows the hearts of the children of men. Psalm 44, 21. Psalm 44, 21. Psalm 44, 21. Watch here. Shall not God search this out? For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. He knoweth the secrets of the heart. Psalm 103, 2 to 3. Psalm 103, 2 to 3. Then worship the Trinity, ASDF. If the Trinity is worship of Sifat, then worship the Trinity. Psalm 103, 2 to 3, verses 2 and 3. Watch this, guys. Watch. Notice what God does and why you should praise him. Praise God, thank God for who he is and what he does. What does he do? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. You know why you should praise God? Because of who he is and what he does for you. What does he do for you? Forgive all your sins and heal all your diseases. But wait, Jesus forgives all sins, heals all diseases, 
knows what's what's the thoughts of the hearts of the children of men, all the characteristics that the Old Testament attributes to God, Jesus exhibits while on earth in the flesh. And this is the second chapter. So you're going to skip Mark 1 and 2 and go to Mark 13 to prove that Mark says Jesus is in God. Really? By the time you finish the second chapter, Mark has gone out of his way to show that Jesus is the almighty, eternal son of God, Jehovah, the God of Israel in the flesh. And that's only the second chapter. Let me give you some more proofs. Some more proofs. Mark 2, 18 to 20. Mark 2, 18 to 20. You know I'm going to have to do a part three on this, right? Mark 2, verses 18 to 20. It's going to get better. It's going to get better. And the disciples of John, guys, you got to really pay attention to this one. And the disciples of John and of the Pharisees used to fast. And they come, they come and say unto him, Why do the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast, but thy disciples fast not? Why is it you don't fast? Now watch here. And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber fast? Meaning those invited to the wedding. Can those invited to the wedding fast? When you're invited to the wedding, you expect to eat. While the bridegroom is with them? Man, if you don't know your Old Testament, if this doesn't move in your spirit, what Jesus just did, I don't know what will. Can the wedding guests fast when the bridegroom is there? It's a wedding for crying out loud. It's time to feast. As long as they are, they have the bridegroom, pay attention, as long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. So when do you fast? But the day will come when the bridegroom will, will be taken away, shall be taken away from them, and then they shall fast in those days. Okay, guys, you know what Jesus said? I'm the bridegroom. As long as I'm here, your bridegroom is here, Israel. It's a time of feasting and celebrating. But when I'm taken away, when I leave, then you start fasting. So who's the bridegroom here? Because he's explaining why his disciples don't fast right now. They don't fast right now because the bridegroom is with them. It's a time of feasting and celebrating because the husband is here. So who's the bridegroom? In Mark 2, 18 to 20, who's the bridegroom? Who's the bridegroom in Mark 2, 18 to 20? Jesus. When do you fast? When he leaves. When he leaves, as long as I'm here, the bridegroom, the husband, time for feasting, it's wedding, celebrate. When I leave, that's when you fast and mourn. Let's go to Isaiah 54, verse 5. Why? This is beautiful. Isaiah 54, verse 5. Isaiah 54, verse 5. Here, guys. Why, uh, why don't you fast? Are you confessing you're a sinner, that you're in rebellion, and you're wicked, you need to repent? Why aren't you fasting? Isaiah 54, verse 5. Now watch here, guys. For thy maker is thine husband. Wait, who is Israel's husband? The Lord, Jehovah, her maker. The Lord of hosts is his name. Thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Old Testament says the bridegroom is Jehovah. Israel's husband is Jehovah, Israel's maker, redeemer, the God of all the earth. Jesus shows up and says, hey, the husband's here. I'm in the flesh. Here's your bridegroom, Israel. Here's your husband. Alice Johnson, do you want my social security too? What about my bank, my, my bank number, my routing number too? Do you want that too, Alistair? Did you catch it? You guys caught what Jesus just claimed to be? The husband of Israel. But you know what? If a Jew was sharp, you know what he'd say? Sharp Jew? Excuse me. Yes. Our Hebrew Bible, Tanakh, says Jehovah is our husband. Our husband is our maker, our redeemer, the God of all the earth, Jehovah. Yes, that's true. But you just said you're the husband. Yes. But you're a flesh and blood Jew. Right on. Absolutely correct. 
I'm still not making the connection here. Help me. You're a Jew. You're flesh and blood Jew. You're a Jew like me. You're claiming to be the husband, the bridegroom. I know my Hebrew Bible. Jehovah is our husband, the bridegroom. He's our redeemer, our maker, the God of all the earth. What are you trying to say? What are you trying to say? This flesh and blood Jew standing before you is Jehovah in the flesh, your maker, your redeemer. I am your husband who became flesh. You get it? But it gets better, folks. It gets a little better. Mark 2, 28. Mark 2, 28. Mark 2, 28. Yep. Watch here. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Let me repeat it again. Jesus saying, therefore, the Son of Man is Lord, is Lord also the Sabbath. Wow, Jesus, what are you saying? This In this context, Jesus is telling the Jews who are complaining about his disciples violating the Sabbath by plucking grains, right? He's saying, wait, the Sabbath was made for man to benefit man, to worship God, not to be a burden to them. And by the way, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath, meaning I can define what you can and cannot do on the Sabbath. I tell you what you can and cannot do. I define what work is and what work isn't on the Sabbath. You know why? Because I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. I'm the sovereign of the Sabbath. I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. I tell you what you can and cannot do. You don't tell me. But wait, Jesus. Leviticus 23 verse 3 says, The Sabbaths belong to Jehovah, not to a man. And Exodus 31, 12 to 17 says that it is Jehovah's Sabbaths, my Sabbaths. They are mine. Exodus 31, 12 to 17, and Leviticus 23, verse 3. The Sabbath belongs to the Lord Jehovah. No man can say he's the Lord of the Sabbath. He owns the Sabbath. He can define what working is on the Sabbath and tell people what they can and cannot do because the Sabbath doesn't belong to man. Though given to man to benefit man, Still, man is subject to the Lord of the Sabbath to do what he says can be done and refrain from what he says can't be done. But you're a Jew saying, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. I define what can and cannot be done on the Sabbath. How can you say this, Jesus? Okay, did everyone get it? Did everyone get the fact that within the first two chapters, Jesus has gone out of his way to show he's the God of Israel, Jehovah in the flesh, the Son of the Father, the eternal companion of the Spirit. And that's in the first two chapters, folks. If you want, I'll do a series on other places in Mark where Jesus is identified as Jehovah in the flesh, but not for today's session. I just wanted to show you that you don't read Mark 13 in isolation and ignore the 12 chapters that went before it. Right? So if I've already been shown by Mark, Jesus is Jehovah in the flesh, before I get to Mark 13, do you want me to believe that Mark is now trying to show me Jesus isn't Jehovah God because he doesn't know everything? Or is there something much deeper going on, much deeper and richer going on, and Mark. You with me there? Lord willing, during one of the one of the weeks, uh, one of the days this week, I'll do a session on Mark. I'll give you some articles on it that I've written. And I'll do it. And I'll show you how Mark goes out of his way to identify Jesus, Jehovah, God in the flesh. So now let's go back to Mark 13. Let's go back to Mark 13. Yes, you can, Tom. Tom, anything said about Jehovah can be said of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So if Jehovah is jealous, the Father is jealous, the Son is jealous, and the Holy Spirit is jealous. If Jehovah is your maker, come on in, Leslie. If Jehovah is your maker, then the Father is your maker, the Son is your maker, and the Holy Spirit is your maker. If Jehovah is your redeemer, then the Father is your redeemer, the Son is your redeemer, and the Spirit is your redeemer. Okay, you with me there?
Mara Shlama Shwawi. Shlama Shwawi. Shlama Odian. Agamini. Okay, now. Yeah, to me it's Satan. Now, with that said, with that said, let's go back to Mark 13. Let's read verse 31 before we get to 32. And I'm going to wrap things up in a minute. Because we're going to do uh, part three tomorrow, God willing. Mark 13, 31. Let's read Mark 13, 31. Someone brought this up earlier, and they're right. Now watch. Mark 13, 31. Pay attention. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. That's Jesus, right? Mark 13, 31. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Let's compare what Jesus says with Jehovah in Isaiah 40, verse 8. Isaiah 40, verse 8, Mark 13, 31. Okay. Isaiah 40, verse 8. Jesus says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. But the word of our God shall stand forever. Let me repeat it a third time. But the word of our God shall stand forever. Let's compare what Jesus says. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Jesus, who do you think you are? Why are you saying God's words are your words and your words are God's words? Because it's the word of God that stands forever. And you say your words stand forever. Why are you making God's words your own words and your own words God's words? That's Mark 13, 31. Now, let me show you that Jesus is higher than the angels. Mark 13, 26 to 27. Mark 13, 26 to 27. Okay. We're going to do a part three tomorrow, God willing. Part three, because it's over two hours and people already complained they're too long. Pay attention, folks. Who controls the angels? Mark 13, 26 to 27. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Jesus, the Son of Man, coming in the clouds with great power and glory, right? And then shall he send his angels. So the Son of Man, Jesus, owns the angels and commands them. And shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Guys, in the same chapter, you see what Jesus said? They are my angels, and I command them and send them out. And they're going to gather my elect. The elect belong to me. You guys catch it? Yeah, this guy pretends he's a Catholic. He knows about the conceal. Not the Council of Nicaea in 325, but the conceal. The Nicene Council that was concealed in 340 AD. See, this guy's a genius here. This Alistair Johnson. There was a Council of Nicaea in 325. But you guys didn't know there was a Nicene Council that was concealed. The concealed Council of Nicaea in 340 AD. Be careful now. Surprise, David. Okay. Now, guys, Mark 3, 26 to 27. Mark 3, 26 to 27. Jesus, the Son of Man, owns the angels, sends them out. And Jesus owns, Jesus owns the elect. Did you see that there in Mark 13, 26, 27, folks? Did you see in Mark 13, 26, 27, Jesus owns, Mark 13, 26, 27, Jesus owns the angels and sends them out to do what? Gather his elect. So the elect belong to Jesus, the Son of Man, and the angels belong to Jesus, the Son of Man. Okay. Everyone got that? Because I'm about to wrap up and do part three tomorrow. And I'm going to give you some links before I go. Everyone got that? That his angels, his elect. He commands his angels to gather his elect. Okay. Then explain this to me. Mark 13, 19 to 20. Mark 13, 19 to 20. His angels to gather his elect. Mark 13, 19 to 20. Okay. For in those days shall be affliction, such as was not from the beginning of the creation, which God created unto this time. So God created the creation. Neither shall be. Right? Now notice this, verse 20. And except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sake, the sake of the elect, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. Okay, now I'm confused, guys. Jesus said, the elect are those whom the Lord God chose. The Lord, who is the God who created creation? He chose the elect. They are his. 
But in the same chapter, Mark 13, 27, Jesus says, the elect are mine, the son of man. I'm the son of man and the elect belong to me. But earlier he said, the elect belong to the Lord whom he chose. Who is the Lord? The God who created at the beginning. So do the elect belong to the son of man or to the Lord God who's the creator? And is it the word of God that endures forever or the word of Jesus Christ that endures forever? What's going on here? Right? What's going on here? I'm just going to go ahead. All right. Does this sound like Jesus is not God in the flesh, but a creature? Or does this sound like Jesus is God in the flesh, distinct from the Father and the Spirit, who is the eternal Son of the Father, eternal companion of the Spirit, Jehovah God of Israel in the flesh? Everyone got that? Is that clear? Who's confused? Okay. If it's clear, Lord willing, part two tomorrow, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time because I'm not done with Mark 13 yet, but I gave you a lot of information. Go back, re-listen, hit the like button, re-listen and re-re-listen until it becomes second nature because I don't want to make it three, four-hour sessions. And pray. More people come and benefit. Pray for me, my daughters, for our health, our safety, our provision. Pray for us to be in love with Jesus and that God keeps filling me to bless you and serve you until Jesus calls me home. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. We love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Tomorrow, part three, where I continue, Mark 13, 32, and then Hebrews 1, 5, if the Lord Jesus wills. So keep praying, keep worshiping, keep loving, and pray for me, my family, and fast for us. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Love you guys for the sake of Jesus. Take care.